clip that comes out of the movie Fireproofs. Great movie. If you've not seen it, you need to get it. You can rent it at one of these places that rents videos. It's a great movie. I love that illustration when he glues the salt and pepper shakers together uh, as an illustration of how marriage is supposed to make two people one. And if you pull them apart, one of them or both of them is going to break. If you're a guest today, I'm in a series of messages called Building a Marriage That Works. And today, we're going to talk about that being pulled apart. And I've entitled the message today, How to Stay Together When You're Falling Apart. And there's all kinds of things that try to pull us apart in marriage. And I never cease to be amazed at what we fight over and what conflict is over in our marriages. You know, it's like, okay, I... I I'm married, my wife's sitting on the front row down here, you know, we, uh, uh, we, we, we argue, we have conflicts, and I, I'm amazed sometimes at the things we argue about and the conflicts we have. You know one of our big conflicts? One of our big conflicts is over odor. And we're not talking about my body odor, okay? I, it, it may be that she just hadn't told me that yet, but on what things smell like in the house. Now, y'all can look at me and tell that I like fried foods. I mean, I do. I, I'm sorry to all you help folks, and I really do, but I like fried food. So every once in a while, I'll get in the house, and I'll fry me something good like some fried bologna, you know? <laughs> Now, y'all don't laugh when you get to heaven. I go have fried bologna at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I'll fry me some bologna or I'll fry me a hamburger, some french fries or something. And my wife will come in the house and she'll go, you've been frying. I can smell it. You know, it smells like a grease pit in here, you know. And so I got good, you know. I got where I try to cover it up. I, I go over there and hide the evidence. Every married man in here knows what I'm talking about. I try to hide the evidence and wipe it up and stuff. she come in and don't work. The sniffer's working. She goes, you tried to hide it, but I can tell. What'd you fry? You fried. I can smell it. It's terrible. And so she fussed at me. She's always in a good mood when she does that, too. And, <laughs> and then I'll come in the house and she will have taken one of those cans of tuna. And you open that thing and it smells like you've opened a cesspool. And then she'll take that tuna and she'll mix something in it. And then it's just, I'm going, man, Ziggy, the dog died. Where is he? We got to clean him up and get him out of here. Then they'll, t and, my, and, and the girl does this too. They, they'll put, they'll, they'll take that and put it on bread and put cheese over top of it and then put it in that toaster. So now it smells like burn crap. I mean, in the whole house. I mean, I'm just walking around. My brother-in-law was over there, and he, he was saying the same thing. This time I wasn't, he's going, what in the world? I go, Tina, Tina, it's Tina. And, and I'm always in such a pleasant mood when I point that out. You know, I'm going, God, it stinks. You know, something real pleasant. People are always fussing over those kind of things. Yesterday, my wife and I, uh, had to go do a little shopping. Uh, this kind of shopping. See, our, our dishwasher at the house broke. The dishwasher's broken. And I'm going shopping with her because I want a dishwasher because I figure if we don't buy a dishwasher, I might have to become the dishwasher. So we, we're going to buy one and we were looking at them and you know, after about two hours, uh, I sort of migrated apart because five minutes after we was there, I was already picked one, had it installed mentally. And so I, I move over and, and I go over to where they got those little miniature refrigerators. Y'all know those little miniature refrigerators that you put in your offices, you know, about 36 inches high. So I go over there and there's this young couple over there looking at a uh, mini refrigerator. And I couldn't, have, I'm preaching on marriage anyway, so I was doing research. So I just stand over there listening to them and I could hear them talk. You could tell they were from the South because they did that, sweetheart, that won't fit. You know, they go from sweetheart, to, that won't fit. Just, you know, without taking a breath. Honey, that, that's just right. Leave me alone. And so they were going on for about 10 minutes. So I migrated back over to the dishwashers. And then about 15 minutes later, I migrated back over. And I'm telling you, when I got back over there this time, this poor, they were in their early 30s. This poor girl, I'm not making this up. She was in tears. 
She was weeping and crying. And the husband had his arm wrapped around her, patting her on the back. It'll be all right, honey. We'll pick one out. It'll be fine. I'm going, are, we're not talking about what child we're going to adopt. Here's which refrigerator we're going to get. And I thought that was bad until I went into the bathroom. And I went in the bathroom, and when I did, I saw this man who'd been overlooking the dishwashers with us. Guys, I'm not making this up. I promise, I'm not making this up. This guy's about my age. I walk into the bathroom, and he is standing in front of the mirror. There's not another human being in this bathroom. He is in the bathroom by himself, and he is looking in the mirror, and he is talking to himself. And when I walk in, he's going, why do I go shopping with her? Why do you do it? Why do you, you've got to be stupid. Why I've been here all day. Why do you do it? And I'm, and then when I walk in, he sees me and he quits talking to the, the, the mirror and he turns to me and without saying a word, he just goes, why do we do it? And I go, I don't know, man. <laughs> and, and, and so we were bonded, man. We were bonded. And, and all we were saying is why? And he's going, I got another hour. I promise you. He said, I know which one I want. And she probably does too, but we ain't going anywhere. And I, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Bro. And so uh, we walked out and I told my wife that story and she's laughing more this morning than she did yesterday. But anyway, uh, we, we, we know what we're talking about. We get all kind of conflicts like that over these big, 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 big things. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're married, you've had conflict. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. All right. And, and, and for those of you who are not married, this sermon's still for you. Because if you know somebody, you've had conflict, okay? If you got a mama, if you got a daddy, if you got a boyfriend, if you got a brother, if you got a sister, you know, if you got a, a, a 12th cousin that lives in Africa, you've had conflict. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about how to deal with conflict in a marriage. I wanna show you this Bible verse. By the way, inside your bulletin, you've got study notes if you're a guest today. Pull them out, all the verses will be on them and you can take notes and follow along. Here's Mark chapter three, verse 25. I want everybody to read this verse out loud with me. Can you read it? Let's go. A home filled with strife and division destroys itself. Boy, that's a true statement. I'm beginning to believe there ought to be a mandatory law in America that says before you get married, you have to take a class on how to handle conflict in a relationship. Most of us were never taught how to deal with conflict in a relationship. Even some of you that are married and went to premarital counseling, most premarital counseling doesn't teach you how to deal with conflict. So a lot of us have scars and we need to learn how to handle this conflict. That's why today I've entitled the message, how to stay together when we're being pulled apart or falling apart. And I wanna look at some practical ways on dealing with conflict in our lives. And again, the, these principles will fit wherever you are at whatever station of life you're in. It'll help you with your business, with, with dating, with, with marriage, with, with mama and daughter, son and father, brother and sister, sibling. Uh, the, these are, are, are great principles. So let's talk about how to handle this conflict. And I want us to begin, write this down. I want to talk about the causes of conflict. What causes fights? What causes conflicts? Well, the Bible's pretty clear. It, matter of fact, the Bible is blunt about this. The Bible says conflict is caused by selfishness. I'm going to say that again. Conflict is caused by selfishness. Everybody repeat that sentence with me. Say it out loud. Conflict is caused by selfishness. Now, you're going to get the point that I want to make this point clear. So I'm going to say it again. I want you to fill in the blank when I stop. Conflict is caused by selfishness. Now, let me show you. The Bible says in James 4, 1, read it out loud. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war within you. Now, we're all basically selfish. Let's admit it. Everybody in this room is basically selfish. You say, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. I want what I want. 
more than I want what anybody else wants. You want what you want. Now watch, here's what happens. When I want what I want and you want what you want and those wants come into, to, they collide, then we have conflict. If I want one thing and you want another thing, we're going to have conflict over who gets what they want. Now, let, let me give you an example, okay? Let, let me do a quick survey. How many people in this room now own one or you bought one at some point in your life? How many people in this room have ever bought and owned an electric blanket? Raise your hand up in there, okay? Yeah, a lot of people. Now, when you bought your electric blanket, surely you were smart enough to get two controls on that thing, right? I mean, seriously, because there are no two body types that are exactly alike. And y'all get under that thing and one of you wants a sauna and one of you wants a refrigerator. And, and, and you've got them going. I mean, now my wife and I are different when it comes to this. Of course, some of it has to do with the fact that she's skinny and pretty and I'm fat and ugly. But anyway, uh, we, we get into bed and I look over and my wife not only has every blanket on our bed, but every blanket in the bedroom, she went and robbed the kids' blankets. And she's wrapped up, and I'm laying over going, there ain't nothing else to take off, man. I get arrested. I'm, I'm burning up over here, okay? Now, uh, that, that's conflict, you know? And they got these now beds, what is it, is it a, a sleep number beds? And they advertise, I hear it on advertise on TV. You can set yours for this number and yours for this number. Everybody's got a different number, okay? We got different numbers when it comes to money, too. We got different numbers when it comes to what we're gonna watch on television, what kind of car we're gonna have, what kind of clothes we're gonna wear, and what are we gonna do with our free time? So conflict comes when I want what I want and you want what you want, and those wants collide, that's conflict. Now, growing up, most of us learned some kind of way to deal with conflict. Now, there are five ways most of us have learned to deal with conflict. And I want you to look at these. I'm going to go over them one at a time. First, you have what I call the my way people. Now, here's the my way people. We're going to fight until I win and I get my way. You know, I'm right, you're wrong, and that's it. And I'm gonna stand my ground until you see it my way. All right? Now that's how some of us deal with conflict. And if you don't know it, your spouse probably does. Or the people you work with probably do. Others are what I call the no way people. And here's them. There's no way you're gonna get me in an argument over that. I'm not going to get into a fight. I, so you withdraw, you pull back, you ignore the problem, and you avoid conflict. Now, your relationship is calm, but you never solve anything. You never settle anything. It is a false calm. It is a false peace. That's why one day you just explode and let them have it, you know? And they're going, what did I do? And you're going, what you did is the last year that I hadn't said anything about. And you're going to get it all right now, okay? So those are your no way people. And then there's the your way people. Th these are the people who are always giving in. Here's their motto. Here's the your way motto. Whatever. Whatever. They always give in because, look, they want approval so badly, they'll just roll over and play dead and become a doormat because they just... You know, they just always give in. I'm always wrong, you're always right. And it, what that produces is bitterness in the person who's always given in. And then there's the halfway people. And we think this is the good way. The halfway people are compromising. I go, okay, I win some, you, you win some. I lose some, you lose some. And we go, okay, I gave in last time, you give in this time. And granted, that's better than the other three ways, but it's not the best way. The best way is called the our way people. These are couples and relationships that say, we, we, we have mutual goals. We want to get to the same place. So we're going to work out a way we can agree on to get to where we want to go. Here's what these people say. They say, now watch this carefully. Everybody listen. 
we value our relationship more than we value this issue that we're fighting over. I talk to couples all the time and I listen to some couples and I say, all right, what's the problem? And they will tell me what they're fighting over. And sometimes, I don't say this, but sometimes I want to look at them and go, really? You guys are going to divorce over this? And every once in a while I will look at them and say, so what you're telling me is that this issue is more important to you than your relationship with each other. And that's what we do. When we allow issues that we disagree over to separate us, we're saying that that issue is more important than our relationship. Most marriages go through stages. I, I've, I've defined three stages that most marriages go through. There's the happy honeymoon stage. Everything's great. And then they move into the, the party's over stage. And eventually they move into the let's make a deal stage. All right. And, and what happens is dating turns to debating. You used to spend time dating and courting. Now you spend time debating and arguing. And, and we sort of grin at that, but the truth still hurts. I'll guarantee you there are people in this room right now, sitting in this room, listening to me. In your marriage or in your relationship, you're stuck. Because you have argued for years over a couple of issues. And you've never gotten anywhere. There's never been a solution. There's never been a reconciliation. And you don't know what to do. And so you say, I'm tired of it. I can't do it anymore. So today, we're going to look at some steps to take on how to move past that. And how to, how to stay together when everything's pulling us apart. So you ready to write down some things? Let's, let's talk about how to pull together. The first thing, and you're gonna think this sounds preachery, but this is the most important thing I'm gonna say. The first thing, when you're pulling apart, the first thing you need to do is call on God for help. Now, let's just take a time out. Write that down, stop, and look up here, and let me just talk to you for a minute, okay? Let's just take a time out. When, 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 when couples come and talk to me about marriage, a lot of times this is what I hear. This is what they say. Well, here are our issues. And, and they go through the issues and they say, we're dealing with all those. This is the way I feel. This is the way I feel. And we talk about that. And then they say, and then of course we got over here, you know, the Christian thing and the God thing and what he wants us to do. And when they say that, here's what they're saying. We've got our marriage and our issues over here and then we got God over here. Like the two don't have anything to do with each other. And what we've got to learn to do, folks, and, 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 and look here now. I'm talking to people. You love Jesus. Your spouse loves Jesus. Y'all come to church. You read the Bible. You pray. You worship. You both love the Lord. And God's in your life. But now watch this. God's in your life, but God's not in your marriage. You've got your marriage and then God's over here. He's something you do by yourself or he's something you do on Sundays. And God doesn't get involved. And so when people talk to me, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I know what the Bible says. But our home, God's got to be involved in that relationship. And so what I'm saying to you is when we as couples have conflict, we've got to ask God to help us deal with the conflict in that relationship. Now, let me give you a picture of what I'm talking about here, okay? Before I come to you and deal with you, I need to go to God and deal with God first. Now, I, I can give you a concrete example about this, okay? There have been times when, when I've been aggravated at my wife, frustrated at my wife, and, and, and I've wanted to lash out and just, you know, let her have it. And, and, and I've stopped it some of those times, and I've gone and I've prayed. And when I've been praying about it, I've said, okay, God, I got to deal with this. I got to talk to Ann about this. I got to deal with this. It's like God says, well, you know, really, you're the idiot, and you're the one doing wrong. And you don't need to talk to her. You need to talk to me because you're the one causing this problem. 
And it's the way you're looking at this and it's what you're doing and you need, you're the one that needs to adjust. And then sometimes when I'm praying about it, then I pray, because here's what God does. God can either change you or you can pray for God to soften the heart of the person you're married to and say, okay, God, I've got to go talk to my spouse about this and I want to pray that you would make my spouse be receptive to what we need to talk about and that you'll make their heart ready to hear you. Not me, not even my side of the story. But God, as we deal with this conflict, we need you to help us to do this. So here's what I'm saying, listen. Before you start dealing with the issue, before you talk to the person who is irritating you, you need to talk to God and ask God. Now, this is what I'm saying, folks. Come here, look at me, listen to me now. Seriously, how many of the conflicts that you have between you and your spouse, do you really go to God in prayer? Not that you talk about prayer, that you and the person you're married to really go and say, God, we need your help here. I've come up with a name this week for this. I call it uh, ventilating vertically. Ventilating vertically. Because we're real good at ventilating horizontally. I don't mind letting you have it. I don't mind telling you what I think. You don't mind ventilating back to me. But instead of just letting each other have it, why don't we let God have it? Seriously, did you know you can do that? You say, well, I can't tell God how I feel. Who says? Read the book of Psalms. Did you know one time David was so mad with somebody that he prayed, God, I pray you'd take their children and bash their babies' heads against the rocks. I'd say that's pretty upset, wouldn't you? Now, I, probably nobody in here has ever done that, but everybody in here as a parent has thought about it. God, just take my kids out and stone them. Just, just stone them. I won't have to, just, just take them out there and just stone them. And, and we, but see, it's a neat thing. You can do that with God. Now, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that's appropriate behavior. But if that's the way you feel, you can talk to God about it. You can go to God and say, God, I'm so tired of this person I'm married to. God, I'm so frustrated with. And you can ventilate to God. Because watch this. God can get over it faster than the person you're married to can. If you go to the person you're married to and you say, you sorry, so-and-so, I'm sick and tired of you, I can't take you anymore. Well, when you get through, you feel better, but they feel worse. But you can go to God and say that. When you get better, God's, God's still cool. He can handle it, all right? So that's why sometimes you need to pray and say, God, am I being hard-headed? Uh, do you need to show me you know, what I need to learn here. Listen to what it says in James chapter four. This is not Jack, this is Bible. James four, two says, look, you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Now, a lot of us know that second part of that verse. You have not because you ask not. But did you know that it is in the middle of a verse on fighting with people? God says, y'all don't have peace because you don't bring me involved into the equation. And then a lot of times, guys, conflict happens when I expect you to meet needs that you can't meet. Did you know that the person you're married to, and everybody needs to hear this, if you're married, and if you're single, you really need to hear what I'm about to say. Because some of you think when you get married, that person's going to meet all of your needs. Uh-uh, but ain't going to work. Ain't going to work. There is not another human being that can meet all of your needs. Here's what happened. Remember when you got married? You stood up there in front of a preacher, just a piece, whoever. You stood up there and you said, I do. Now, you said, I do. But you were thinking, I expect. See, you didn't stand there going, I do. I promise to do everything to make you happy. I promise to do to help you. I promise to be committed to you. You weren't sitting there thinking that. You were standing there thinking, I expect you to make me happy. I expect you to meet all my needs. And then here's what happens. When we get married, and that person doesn't meet our expectations, we get disappointed, disillusioned, and we want to quit. We want to throw in the towel because it didn't happen like we expected it to. 
By the way, let me tell you how you can know if you're looking for somebody else to meet your needs instead of God. Now, it's real simple. Look, if you want to know if you're looking to your spouse or anybody else to meet your needs instead of looking to God, here's how you know. If you get mad or upset when they don't meet your needs, then you know you've been looking for them to do that. Because anger, watch, anger is a warning light that says, I'm expecting you to meet my needs and you didn't do it, so I'm mad. I expect you to be on time. I expect you to notice me. I expect you to do this for me. And when you don't do it, I expect you to say thank you. I expect you to say good job. And if you don't do it, then I'm mad. So, so what I'm saying is, I'm looking at you to make me feel good about myself. I'm not looking to God to do that. So, folks, one of the first things you need to do when, when, when trying to stay together, when everything wants to pull you apart, is you need to get God involved. You need to call on God for help. One of the things I've prayed about this morning is that there will be a resurgence or a restart of couples who are willing to pray together. I'm going to talk about it in detail in a minute. Willing to pray together, especially when there's conflict. Here's the second thing when you want to pull together instead of pulling apart. Part, you need to confess your part of the conflict. Before I start accusing and attacking my partner, I need to do a frank evaluation and ask myself, is this conflict my fault? Or how much of this conflict is my fault? Did I instigate this? Is this happening because I'm in a bad mood? Now, I'm fixing to give y'all some advice. This is such good marriage advice. You need to write this down and write me a check for $10,000 just for this right here. I'm telling you, I'm, this is good stuff right here, all right? Here it comes, you ready? Here it is. When you're wrong, admit it. When you're right, shut up. Really? When you're wrong, just, I was wrong, I'm sorry. I was wrong, I was wrong. And when you're right, just shut up. Now, you say, Jack, how did you learn such wisdom? By doing it the wrong way so many times. You know, by looking at my wife and saying, see, I told you so, if you listen to me to start with, that didn't go too well for me. How'd that go for y'all? Doesn't go too well. It just doesn't. So when you're right, you don't have to poke them with a stick and eye and prove the point that you're smarter than they are. Admit it when you're wrong. Just, I'm wrong. I was wrong. And when you're right, don't rent a billboard on 95. Here's a great marriage verse. We know this verse, but we never think about it with our marriage. By the way, Jesus said this, so listen to it. Why do you look at the speck in another's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? Take the log out of your own eye first, then you'll be able to see clearly. Jesus was a funny guy too. He wasn't always serious. He's fun. This is funny. He's sitting there saying, you're over here criticizing everybody else. Man, you need to look at yourself. You're over there talking about that little bit of speck they got in their eye, and you got this big old two before in yours. He's being funny, but he's trying to make a point. And, and look, most marriages I know have two sets of rules. You got to set a rule for your spouse and you got your set of rules for yourself. They can't do that, but you can do it. If you don't believe me, some of the stuff your spouse pulls on you, turn around and do the same thing back to them. See how well it goes over. It's okay for them to do it, but it's not okay for you to do it. So here's, here's what I'm saying. You need to say, all right, I need to own up to my part of what went wrong. By the way, this is Fred, just throw it in. If you've gone through a divorce, the easiest thing in the world for you to do is sit back and tell about in the world what your former spouse did wrong. I'm going to tell you, you did some stuff wrong too. All of us who've ever gone through a divorce have made mistakes. And what you need to do is sit down and say, all right, I can't fix my former spouse. What parts did I do wrong? Don't want to do them again. And the reason why most second marriages end in divorce too is people don't ever do that. We just, it's easier to blame the other person. But right now, while we're married, understand everybody has blind spots. You do too. If you don't think you have a blind spot, that's your blind spot. It's one of them. We all think it's 
somebody else's problem and it's not my problem, but sometimes it is. So here's what we need to ask. Now, now seriously, okay? Y'all can probably try this day because if you're married, you'll probably have conflict before you go to bed and that. Right? You're supposed to say right back. Right? Right, okay. I'm just checking to make sure y'all still there. So when you have your next conflict, you need to say, am I being unrealistic here? Am I being insensitive? Am I being overly sensitive? I've been counseling couples since before I got married. And one of the things I've learned is we get so sensitive. And this is not just married couples. This is parents and children. These brothers and sisters. We, our fuses, guys, our fuse is so short, it just doesn't take much to light it. And we're so sensitive. All it takes is one word. I've seen it. I've seen mother and daughter standing there. One of them say the wrong thing, and the other one goes, that's it, I'm out of here. Boom. They get the car and they go. Now, at some point in there, don't I have to sit there and say, am I being too sensitive? Can I not let this slide? Am I being too demanding? Am I being ungrateful? In other words, before I deal with the other person, I need to deal with me. You know what the number one excuse for divorce today is? The number one excuse for divorce is incompatibility. We say, well, we're just incompatible. So I thought I'd do a little study on incompatibility. Here's what the leading experts say on incompatibility. Dr. Paul Ternay, the Swiss psychiatrist who wrote the book, Understand Each Other, wrote this. So-called incompatibility is a myth invented by jurists in order to plead for a divorce. It is likewise a common excuse for people to hide their own weaknesses and failings. Misunderstandings and mistakes can be corrected when there's a willingness to do so. The real problem is a lack of complete frankness. And I might add the word inflexibility. Dr. Paul Pompano, the director of the Institute of Family Relations says, I don't believe in incompatibility. I don't believe it exists. Almost any two people are compatible if they try to be. Our marriage is what we make it. This is my favorite quote from a scholar on incompatibility. Dr. Arch Hart said this. I love this quote. He said, if people can be divorced for incompatibility, I cannot conceive why all of us are not already divorced. It's true. I mean, let me tell you, in so many ways, my wife and I are not compatible. In so many ways, we are, but in so many ways, we're different. But, but, but I'm going to give you a great definition of marriage. You need to write this down, okay? Write this down. Here's a great definition of marriage. Marriage is a lifelong process of overcoming your differences, you are, for those of you who are single, you're going to marry somebody and you're going to have differences with them. You're going to need to spend the rest of your life learning how to adjust to the differences between you. And for those of you who think, and there are some in this room who do, that it's always your mate's fault. For those of you who believe it's always your spouse's fault, got a Bible verse for you, 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Each of us has an infinite capacity for self-deception. We can deceive ourselves and be wrong, and just we can't see when we're wrong. It's just easier to blame other people. I know a young man right now today, if you talk to him about his problems, it's everybody else's fault. It's everybody's fault. It's my dad's fault. It's my wife's, it's my wife's fault. It's my mother's fault. It's, it's my sister's fault. It's, my bro- it's everybody's fault. It's never my fault. Okay? L- listen to me. The problem is not, let me say it again. The problem is not incompatibility the problem is selfishness I want what I want you want what you want 
and we collide with our wants. So if we're trying to stay together when we're being pulled apart, here's the third thing we need to do. We need to convene a peace conference. They have them in governments all the time, in businesses all the time. We can't get along. We need to get together and figure it out. We need to have a peace conference. Now, let, let, let me tell you something. Listen to this carefully, okay? Some of you really need to hear what I'm about to say. Conflict is seldom resolved accidentally. It's got to be dealt with intentionally. Because here's some of you are the no way people. You're just not going to fight. You're going to be quiet. Now, now, now listen. Conflict does not get better when you just keep quiet and walk away. Conflict will only get worse when you leave it alone. Because here's what happens. When you just shut up and get silent, your heart gets harder and your position gets more solidified and you're less willing to give in before. So next time when you get mad, you just get mad a hundred times more than you were the first time. Now, Jesus says something about all of this for those of us who are just going to be quiet and we're not going to talk about it. Now, just, I know it doesn't matter what Jesus says, but just right here's what he says, okay? You know, I'm kidding. Here's what Jesus says. If you remember someone has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go at once to make peace. Then come back and offer your gift to God. I was preaching in South Carolina one time and I read that verse of scripture and I saw a guy get up and walk out the door. He called me that night at six o'clock and says, there's no need for me to sit there anymore. I knew while you said that, I knew that there was something wrong between me and another guy. I drove over to his house and we've been dealing with it all day. We got it right. And I couldn't worship God till we went and got it right. Now, I want to tell you something. Listen to me. If you try to serve God, let me give you a warning. I'm going to give you a warning. Now, don't, don't write anything down. Just look up here at me. I'm going to give you a warning. If you get serious, you're going to start serving God. You're going to serve God with all your heart. Let me tell you what happened. Satan's going to try to get in your marriage. Now, I'm going to be a little transparent here. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be a little honest with you. I, I generally study three to four weeks ahead about my sermons. For example, this week, I've been studying all week about what I'm going to preach on in four weeks. And then come Friday... I pick back up my sermon that's ready for today. It's already ready. And I start studying it again on Friday and Saturday. And then I spend a couple hours on Sunday morning studying it again. But I, I've been, I studied four weeks ahead of time. So before I st started this marriage se series, uh, you, you know, so this would have been like eight, nine weeks ago. And this is only the third week in, in the marriage seminar. Eight or nine weeks ago, I started seriously studying about marriage to get ready for this series. And you know what happened? George and I talked about this when it happened. I, Satan started coming at me and attacking me. And all of a sudden, Ann and I started having all kind of conflict. I mean, nothing major, nothing like that. We just started, I was irritable, she was irritable. And we just, it just seemed like everything we did just we just bumping heads. And, and here's, here, here's, here's where it came into play. Now, we're not going to leave each other. We're going, matter of fact, you know, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we go off and spend two days. And it was wonderful. And I remembered how much I like her. She's pretty cool. And, and we had a good time. It was good. I got some sugar and it, that's next week's sermon. Anyway, all right. So we <laughs> send your kids to Awana, okay? Now. Matter of fact, I stopped a 60-year-old man in church this morning and said, you might ought to go teach Awana next week. But anyway, uh, come on, don't miss it. But uh, I'm sitting there five, six weeks out, got to preach this thing on marriage, and, and Ann and I are having these conflicts. So you know what I did? I'm sitting there and I'm going, I, I ain't going to preach on marriage. I, I'm not going to preach on it. Because I'm sitting there, I'm feeling terrible. I'm, I'm going, how, how can I get up and preach on marriage when I got these issues myself? How am I going to get up and tell people about how to have better marriage? But when, when, when we're sitting here arguing over this dumb junk and, and got tension between us, and I'm telling you, I almost did. Matter of fact, I said one, in one of the staff meetings, we were talking about, I said, you know, I'm thinking about I may do something different. 
I mean, I didn't say why, but I said, I may do something different. Here's what preachers say. I just was led of God to, you know, do something different. No. And, and I would, if you don't go, to, if you haven't been going to church and you've decided I'm going to get serious about God and I'm going to come back and get in church again, here's what happened. Satan will try to get in your marriage, try to discourage you in your walk with God. Uh, matter of fact, let me tell you, people, I, I, it'd be amazing to know how many people had an argument this morning in the car on the way to church. I was waiting on that. In the first service, it's an even bigger life. Because, I mean, you know, we, you, you can get in arguments going to Because y'all got to get up. You got to get dressed. You got to get other people dressed. You got to do all that. You hurry. And I know you're late. Everybody at this church is late. <laughs> when Jesus comes back, some of y'all going to say, 10 minutes, God, I'll be ready in 10 minutes. Come on, yeah. so, so you're coming to church and you're arguing. Now, you know, Ann and I used to get in arguments going to church. But we learned how to fix that, really. Ann and I fixed, we never get in an argument coming to church anymore because we come in separate cars. <laughs> I mean, no, I get up and leave. I leave 4, 45, 5 o'clock on Sunday morning. She's still comatose. She's waiting on God to wake up, you know, on Sunday morning at that time of day. And so I go off and I pray and study and, and then grab something to eat and then study and pray some more and so, so that I'm ready. Because, you know, I've learned. I've got to be ready spiritually. When it's time for me to get up here and share it with you. And Satan wants to come and attack you. So listen to what Jesus said. Peter said this, uh, Jesus said this to Peter in 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, treat her, your wife, as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. I have some people come up to me sometimes and they go, man, God's not answering my prayer. And I will go, well, how's things between you and the person you're married to? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says sometimes your prayer's not answered because you and your spouse are not getting along. It blows my mind to have people think they can come to church, sit in here and worship God and have a great time while they're not getting along with each other. Postponed conflict only gets worse. It festers. It turns into bitterness. You need to do something about it as soon as possible. You need to have a peace conference. So let me give you some practical suggestions. Do this real fast. Practical suggestions on how to have a peace conference. First, you need to choose the right time. Now, the right time is not as soon as we say amen, you stand up and say, we got to deal with this right now. Sit down. That ain't a good time. A good time is not while the kids are running around all over your feet. And it's not a good time when you're just about, you know, uh, to fall asleep and you drop a bombshell, you know. Or you're walking, in, here's what you do. You're walking into a friend's house for dinner and you go, by the way, remind me when we get done, I got to talk to you about how sorry husband you are. <laughs> Bad time. You need to pick the time when you're both at your best. You say, when is that? I don't know. When you're both at your best, when you're not tired, when you're not in a hurry, when you're not rushed. Matter of fact, that could be your homework. You can say, hey, we need to schedule a time. I remember not long ago, my wife said to me, we were doing something. She said, we need to set aside some time to talk about this. And we did. We set aside, she sat on the bed, I sat down in the chair, and we sat there. We'd set aside, that was an appointment. We'd made with each other, we'd sit there and we talked about it, okay? So you need to pick the right time. Then you need to pick the right place. You need to be alone, interrupted, not with kids, not with people. Take the phone off the hook. By the way, let me tell y'all something. There is not a law in the universe that says just because that phone rings, you have to answer it. Do you know that? Some smart guy invented something called voicemail. Let them leave a message, you can call back. Now I'll tell you, I'll sit right here and tell you. I don't answer my phone every time it rings. I do most of the time, but if I'm sitting there talking with another couple or if I'm dealing with something, I'm not going to look at them and say, I know y'all about to divorce and kill each other, but stop. I got to see if my wife needs some milk. They can leave it, you'll get back. So if you're having a peace conference, listen, if you're sitting there having a serious conversation and the phone rings, let it ring. Deal with it. And then I want to say something important. Now, everybody listen. Don't write. Don't write. Look up. Matter of fact, I want to know y'all listening. Everybody do this right here. Come on. Wave at me right here. You listen. All right, look at In front of other people is never, ever the right time to deal with an issue with your spouse. It is never the right time or place for you to sit there in front of another person and criticize and put down and complain and berate your spouse in front of somebody else. That's wrong, pure and simple. 
And you and I have gotten in the habit of it. We complain about the person we're married to, to everybody. You say, well, I need to talk to somebody. Go see a counselor. But don't just pick your brother-in-law, your brother, your mother, your sister, your neighbor, and stand there and tell them how bad you got it and how bad your spouse is. All you're doing is reinforcing your own negativity. And when you do that in front of the person you're married to, you embarrass them, you belittle them, and you just make them more solidified in what's wrong than before. Belittling people and embarrassing people is wrong. I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it. We need to quit doing it. And then don't try to resolve the conflict in bed. I mean, that's not time to talk about it. <laughs> See, let me tell you. My wife, God bless her, she, I tell her, she has no conscience at all. Because she can lay down on the bed. When she lays down on the bed, you, you, you got, if you want to talk, you got 30 seconds, buddy. Because when she lays down, the lights go out and she's asleep, you know, and, and, and I don't go to bed generally till I'm ready to go to sleep too. So let's just say you, you're laying there in bed and you say, hey, I want to talk to you about something. You go, oh, okay. Oh yeah. What do you want to talk about? Well, we need to talk about the kids. We got a problem. Okay. What is it? Well, you know, our daughter, she went... And then you get mad. You have, you don't even care. I don't care. I'm sleepy, baby. I'm sleepy. I'm doing this pretty good, ain't I? You're sitting there thinking, he done this before, hasn't he? Yeah. On, on, seriously, let me go take a shower or something, you know? I mean, that's not the place to do this, all right? So, and then let me make another suggestion. Before you have this little powwow, this little peace conference, pray together. Pray before you argue. So, really, come here. Now listen. Because it's real hard. It's real hard to sit there and hold hands and say, God, we're about to talk about a delicate issue here and this is going to be tough. And God, we're going to ask you to help us as we talk about this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, idiot, let me tell you what the heck you've been doing wrong. You sorry, good for nothing, blankety blank, blank, blank. I'm sick and tired. It's hard to do that, okay? So, so, so pray about it. Now, let, let me say something. Guys, on every male person in this room, raise your hand. Whether you're married, it don't matter because one of these days you might be. All right, raise your hand. Guys, the Bible says it's our job to make sure prayer happens in our home. I didn't write it. That's what the book says. It's our job. We, we're responsible for making sure that when prayer needs to be had in home, buddy, we, we come to the plate and we say we need to pray. Can't pass the buck. God gave us that job. So we got to do it. And then ladies, let, let me say a word to you here, okay? If your husband says to you, let's pray, don't do this. <sighs> okay. Or don't do what some couples do and they go, who do you think you are? Are you going to pray? You think you're more spiritual than me? You're going to pray? Who do you think you are? Well, let me tell you who he is. All right? Let me tell you who he is. He's a sinner that doesn't deserve heaven or grace, but God in his grace has given him grace and forgiveness, and he can pray because of God's grace. By the way, so are you. And ladies, let me just say something. If you have a husband who is willing to pray with you, you are already ahead of the game. I, I preached this in the first service. At the end of the second service, we got a guy in our church, he's about six, four, big, huge guy, uh, former football coach, walked up to me and, and grabbed me by the hand. Me, his, his hand swallows mine. He looked at me and he says, let me tell you, Jack, the one thing that changed our marriage is when I started praying with my wife. Changed both of us. And, and, and I know praying in front of people, they say, is something we all get scared about. I know that. But, and that's why we don't call on people to pray. Okay? But let me just say something about that. All right? If you can have a conversation with Bubba, you can pray. I mean, if you don't talk to anybody, you can pray. 
Because all praying is, is you just talking to God. That's it. That's it. Now listen to me. There is no wrong way to pray. There is not a wrong way to pray. You're just talking. So if you can open your mouth and let words come out, you can talk to God. And anybody, and th- this is where I'm saying, if your husband opens up his mouth and he starts praying and it doesn't sound like me, first of all, thank God for that. Second, don't criticize. I mean, just, you're just praying. You're just talking to God. There's no reason for us. Now, I understand it is. I'm not a fool. But there's no reason to be intimidated about prayer. Just, you're just talking to God. There's no wrong way to do it. You cannot mess up. You just say, hey, God, just, you know, things pretty crappy. I need some help here. That's a good prayer. You can say what you want to. My favorite blessing because people always call on me to pray. When we eat, it's uh, it, it, 20 people there. They're going to call on me to pray because I'm preaching. They say, Jack, pray for the food. And generally, I'm hungry, so I'll say something like, God, thanks for this food. Amen. <laughs> I'm sincere. I'm really thankful for this food, and I want to get to it. <laughs> we'll get to the missionaries when I get back to the office. You, you know, there's no wrong way to do it. And then come with a positive attitude. When, when you're going to have this peace conference, come with a po- You're coming to reconcile, not to criticize. <laughs> I kept telling these people one time, you and your wife need to go on a date. You and your wife need to go on a date. So they went on a date. I saw him the next week. I said, how'd it go? He said, I ain't doing that again. I said, why? He said, well, we went on a date. We ordered the food, and as soon as I ordered the food, she had a list of 50 things that she didn't like about me, and she sat there and tore me apart through the whole dinner. I ain't inviting her out and paying for that again. I said, that's not a date. That's a counseling session without the counselor. A date's a date. And a prayer time is not a time for you to sit there and and tell God what you really want to tell your spouse. And it's not a time to criticize. When you're sitting there having a peace conference, listen, you're not going to get anything solved when you sit there and just tell them what you don't like about them. You got to sit there and say, all right, we need to find a way to handle this. I'm not trying to criticize. I'm trying to reconcile. Let's deal with this. All right, and I need to move on. And number four, you need to cut the abusive language. You got to attack the issue without attacking each other. How many of you, I want to do a little survey here because I'm fixing to do something. How many of you in this room read a quiet time I wrote this week on cussing? Did anybody read it? Yeah, you did? You need to go back and read it. And when you do it, if you read it, you probably noticed something very unique about that one. If you hadn't noticed it, you check it out. I've had several people say, did you know? I went, yeah, what do you think? And then they tell me, there's another one coming, so hang on. There's a point to the madness, all right? So just hang on. But uh, uh, the point is this yelling and cussing and fussing. Now, in a marriage, we need to learn to not use inflammatory and wrong words. It's not Jack. Listen, Ephesians 4.29. Do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed. Colossians 3.8 says, put away all these things, furious rage, malice, insults, and shouted abuse, and don't deceive each other with lies anymore. There are five things in that verse God says are out of bounds when you're having an argument. All right, are you listening? Next time you and your spouse have an argument, it's five things you can't do. No furious rage. That means you can't intimidate them with anger. First one to get mad loses. Put away malice. You know what malice is? Using words to intentionally hurt them. Let me put it in Jack language. Pushing their buttons because you know where they are. You don't use insults. You're just like your mother. What does that solve? What does that resolve? You're not to use shouted abuses. No foul mouth, no vulgarity, no obscenities, obscenities, no profanities. Listen, if you and your mate are having an argument, you tell me what good it does to look at them and call them a four letter word or an eight letter word. What's that gonna solve? Nothing. Matter of fact, I don't generally fight. I mean, I, I, I don't fight. But if y'all ever 
wake up and open the newspaper and there's a picture of me being arrested and taken to jail for fighting, it'll probably be because I was walking down the street and I saw some man standing there talking to his wife or his kids and he's screaming and yelling and cussing at him. Everything in me wants to just take and just knock his head off his shoulders and say, didn't your daddy tell you how to treat a woman or children? It's just not a place for that. And, and, and it's not a place for a wife to do it either. And then don't play mind reader. Come on, guys. If you're going to have a, here, here's what happens. You know, one of you is mad and the other one goes, what's wrong? Nothing. Yeah, there is. I can tell something. Something's wrong. You know what's wrong. No, I don't. Tell me what it is. Well, you ought to know. <laughs> and if you don't know, that's part of the problem. <laughs> okay, women, come here. Look, women, come here. All the women, wave at me. Women, wave at me. Okay, now I'm fixing to tell you. This is, you need a $100,000 check for this. Okay, look here. Women, look here. I'm going to tell you something about men. Come here, look, let me tell you something about men. We're stupid. <laughs> really. Especially when it comes to y'all. I mean, we can build a rocket ship and it can go to the moon and Mars. But we, here's the problem. We don't know. We really don't know. And it's not because we don't care. We're just dumb. So, so just do us a favor and tell us. My wife got mad at me the other day and I tried my best to figure out what it was. And so I thought I figured it out. So all day I'm working on doing it right. And by the end of the day, I figured out I was working on the wrong thing <laughs> all day. And I didn't even have a clue. And then when she took, I went, oh, that's it. I didn't even thought about that. And then I look like I'm covering up. Yeah. No, I'm just dumb. And I'm preaching on this. And I'm dumb. If I don't know, they don't know. So my point, and I'm making a joke, but it's, look. Look at them and say, here's the problem. Look at, you can pull it. My wife, she's been listening to me preach too long. The other day, we were sitting there talking. She said, look at me. Listen. <laughs> she did. She, look at me. Jesus, are you listening? Nod your head. <laughs> so you have my permission. Look at me. Look at me. I'm going to tell you what's wrong. You can't figure it out. I'm going to tell you what's wrong. When you this morning, when you call me an idiot, that's what's wrong. Okay? So just tell. All right, number five, I got to do this face. Five, I, I, I need to consider my mate's perspective. And this is not easy, guys. This is not easy. But I'm going to give you. Here's the secret of resolving conflict. Understanding where the other person came from. You see, the two of you are not the same. You didn't have the same parents. You didn't have the same background. You don't have the same temperament. One of you is male. One of you is female. You are not coming from the same place. So you need to try to figure out where are they coming from. I had somebody call me last night. I can say this because they're from out of town. Somebody called me last night. And they were saying, we just had a big fight. Tell me about it. Well... And he's telling me, well, he doesn't want me to do this. He doesn't want me to do that. And I go, well, now let me ask you a question. Why doesn't he want you to do this? I don't know. We've just been fighting about it. I said, well, did you ever think about asking, why do you not want me to do this? I mean, there's got to be a reason why you don't want me to. Tell me what it is. Maybe it's because in the past, when you did that, bad things happened. Maybe there's a lack of trust. What's the issue? Now, now l l here's a project. Next time you get in an argument, see if you can do this. See if you can turn around and take the other person's position and explain it. Now, there's only one way to do this. Listen. That's the only way to do it. You just got to listen. So you need to try to understand before you try to be understood. 
There's a great verse, Romans 15, 2, that says, we must bear the burden. This is a burden of being considerate of two things, the doubts and the fears of other people. Now, you know your fears are real. You know your doubts are real, but you don't think their fears are real. Or their fe- Let me tell you something. If the person you're married to is afraid, well, I'm afraid they're going to leave me. And you say, well, that's dumb. No, it's not. If they fear it, why do they fear it? Have you created an atmosphere where they're insecure? The word, uh, Philippians 2, 4 says, look to each other's interests and not merely to your own. The word look is the word scopus. It's the word for a scope on a rifle when you really look into it. In, In Jerusalem, there's a hill on top of Jerusalem called Mount Scopus. You can get up on Mount Scopus and see the whole city. What Paul is saying here is you need to get up on Scopus so that you can see not just your opinion but their opinion and see how they feel not just how you feel now honestly can you articulate why your spouse thinks and feels the way they do you need to and then number six you need to concentrate on reconciliation not resolution look guys resolution means you solve the problem reconcile means you're getting along again now, now, uh, l- listen carefully. You're not going to resolve all the issues. Never. But you can reconcile. Reconciliation means to reestablish the relationship. Resolution means to resolve every issue. Now, I, I, I got news for everybody. Everybody's married. Listen to me. You're never going to solve all your issues. Some of y'all been fighting over the same thing for 15 years. Clue here. Clue. Y'all may not ever figure that one out. So guess what? You come to a point where you can agree to disagree, but still like each other. My wife doesn't, ag- and I don't agree on everything. Sometimes we just have to say, we don't agree on this. But that doesn't mean we've got to act like horses, rich. I gave an illustration this morning with George sitting right there, our associate. George and I don't agree on everything that happens in this church. But you know what? We can sit there and say, well, you know what? We just disagree. But we can go to lunch. Now, you need to get to the point where, again, I go back to what I said earlier. Your relationship is more important than the issue you're fighting over. Now, now, here's James 3.17 defines wisdom. You want wisdom? Here it is. Wisdom is peace-loving and courteous. And here it is. Watch. It allows discussion and is willing to yield to others. If you can't discuss it, you're not wise. And if you're not willing to bend, you're not wise. Sometimes you just have to say, hey, 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 look, I've got some very, very close friends. We disagree politically about just about everything. But we're still good friends. I just said, hey, look, you're my bud. I got other buds that are stupid too. <laughs> you're just one of my stupid buds, but you're, you're my bud. Now, you can't say that to your wife. You can't say, well, you know, I love you even though you're stupid. But you can say, I love you even though we disagree. Now, I'm going to close with just giving you two suggestions. Sometimes you reach issues and you can't get past them. If you do, you need to go get professional help. I've had men look at me. I don't need counseling. I can handle this. I've had women. I'm not going to counsel. I don't need counseling. You know what you're saying when you say that? You're saying, I'm chicken. Because if I get in the room, I'm going to look stupid and I'm, I'm chicken. And I'd, I'd really rather go on miserable than deal with this. And then the other thing, they say, well, what if my mate won't go? Well, go by yourself. At least you'll get help. Go on. You learn how to deal with it better. But most importantly, here's the advice I give you. You need to get some help from God. Colossians 3, 5 says, let the peace of heart that comes from Christ be present in your hearts. I want you to just close your eyes. Let's have a word of prayer before we leave today. I really believe that so much of what we fight about could be solved if as a husband and wife we're willing to get down and pray together and we ask God to help us not be selfish but to be considerate of the other person. But you can't call on somebody you don't know So if you've never invited Jesus in your heart, I want to encourage you to do that right now. Just say, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. 
I want you to forgive me. I want you to lead my life. Come into my marriage, come into all aspects of my life. I want you to be my savior. And then those of us that are even believers, we need to say, God, I need you more involved in my marriage and my relationships. I don't want you to be a side issue. I want you to be the central issue in my relationship. God, again, I pray for the marriages in this room. Give us the wisdom to be patient and understanding and kind and loving and forgiving. Help us to be like you and involve you in our relationships. Protect us from the evil one who wants to come against us in our relationships. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming. Have a great day. As you leave, don't forget to put in your offering and your communication slip. Have a great day. God bless. Single adult.